You know why Jesus is special? Because he's the only one who did that. He is the only one to have died and in three days rose again to be our author of our salvation. So if you know this song, sing it with us. It's called Mighty to Sing. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Oh, my God. 
Let me tell you that Jesus can move them. But the funny thing is, he can move the mountains. But sometimes he allows us to climb them to make us stronger. To trust him in everything. Because the valleys are nice, you know? The valleys are fertile. They have, they have water. They, they have wildlife. The valleys are great sometimes. <coughs> but just in Exodus, Yahweh God was on the top of the mountain with Moses. Moses had to climb to get to him. He didn't, he, God did not come down to pick Moses up and say, here you go. He said, if you want to be with me, come to me. If you want to hear my words, come to me. If you want to hear his words, there's a Bible in front of you. Let me tell you, those are his words. If you want to hear from him still, pray. These are so simple. It's so simple. Why do we complicate it? That can't be it. That can't be all. That's, is, it, is that how God speaks to his people through his word and we just pray to him? That's it? I don't have to do anything else? That's it. And that's what he wants. And how many times do we say, I got time for that. I'll pray later. I'm kind of tired. You know what? I want to finish that Netflix show. I have done that. I, I do not stand before you uh, innocent. <laughs> but let me tell you, our God is mighty to save. He will take you where you are today. No matter what you've done, where you've been, he will take you and he will change you. You don't have to change yourself. He will change you. His spirit will change your heart. I guarantee it. I guarantee it because it's in his word. It's not because I said it. <laughs> this next song is called King of My Heart. And we're just going to sing. It may be a little repetitive, but we're just going to sing about how good our God is this morning. You are good because scripture says there is none good under heaven and earth. And we know in the New Testament when, when Jesus, uh, when his disciples came up and said, Oh, good, good teacher, good father. He says, who are you calling good? He says, there is only one good, and that is God. So we're going to sing how good our God is.
there was a family um, who were volunteer firefighters. They were, they were EMS, they were firefighters, they, they did the whole nine yards. And um, they get the call uh, to, uh, it's a husband and wife, and they get the call to their, uh, his parents' house. Uh, it's fully engulfed, um, and they end up losing uh, his parents. Oh, I'm sorry, it's her parents. I'm sorry. Um, it is her parents. They, they, they both died in the fire. And they began to struggle with their faith and with, with God, and they wrestled with them and said, how is this good? How can anything be good come out of this? And she said something that really stuck with me this week. And she said, God spoke to her and said, your good is not the same as my good. My perception, God's perception of good and making things work for the good of those that love God. Even though it may not look good to us, our perception of good is to make us comfortable. His perception of good is to expand his kingdom and to see people and children come to know him. I just want to leave you guys with that. Remember this week, our perception of good might not be God's perception of good in our own situation. Remain uh, standing. And we do, we can sing songs like that and, and hopefully the, the Lord is ministering to you as, as He does through song. Um, but uh, sometimes we do, we can sing songs and, and as He had said, it, it, you feel like, well, this is just the same thing over and over again or it's just so repetitive. And, uh, I'm going to read a passage here, Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around and within and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, the, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and they were created all day every day all night every night that we imagine day and night there's no day and night right now but all the time holy 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 the lord god almighty so um where is your heart where is your mind today we are going through this series called Doctrinal DNA. We're getting to the root, to the very heart, the pulse of what do we believe and why do we believe it. We are a Southern Baptist church here, Conowingo Baptist Church. And so we say that we align with the Baptist faith and message. And so if you can go online, you can find the Baptist faith and message. It's divided into different sections. We are in section 9 this week and we're going to be talking about the kingdom. We're going to be talking about the kingdom. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read verses 24 to 30, and then we're going to uh, break and go to 36 to 43. But I say, where is your heart today? Where is your heart this morning? We're going to be learning about the kingdom, and what we're going to see is the kingdom of God has two senses. There's one sense that God is king over everything, which He is. Both senses are true. God is king over everything, right? Now, whether we acknowledge it or not, it doesn't matter. He is king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. That's one sense. But there's another sense of the kingdom. That sense is personal. That sense has to do with you and the king. In that sense, we find out that there are two types of people. There are the type of people who believe in Jesus. They have turned from their sin. They've turned to Christ. And they've been saved. They've been born again. And then there are people who are lost. They've never turned their life over to Christ. They've not been personally accountable to Jesus to say, you know what, He is the King, He is the Lord, and I'm going to follow Him all the days of my life. I believe He died for me, I believe He resurrected for me, so I am confessing that truth. He's saved. 
my life. He saved my soul. I believe it. It's true. And so we're going to see that today. This is the doctrine of the kingdom. And here we are in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read this. Another parable Jesus, he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares. That tares, those are weeds. Sowed weeds among the wheat. And then he went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And so the servants of the owner, they came and they said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Well, how then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so I want to pause here before we get to the next section. We're going to go to verse 36 after this, but I just want to pause here. Because this parable is extremely important for us to understand as followers of Christ. Because what he is saying is, look, when we look around and we see sin and we see bad things in the world, it, this parable teaches us, look, it's a good thing to look at God and say, how did this happen? That is what the servants say. He says, look, I, I sowed good seed in the field, and, and then an enemy came in and sowed bad seed, and the servants of the field come back to the owner, and they say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some weeds here. I thought you said it was good. I thought you said this was a good place. Like, I'm looking around. It's not so good. And the owner of the field says, yeah, there's an enemy. There's an enemy in this field. And so the servants, like we would often do, well, why don't we just go up and just gather it up and we'll throw it away, right? We'll, just, we'll gather up the weeds. We can do this ourselves. And the master of the field says, no. You go do that, you're going to gather up wheat and weeds. You're going to throw out good stuff too. So I want you to think about and realize, is, is some of us would say to God, God, why don't you just take it all away right now? And here's the truth. And perhaps this is more personal than you thought it might be right now. If you're lost right now, if you're lost, if God just went in right now into this place and said, okay, you're lost, I'm, picking, I'm throwing it away right now, that would include you. And so he says, no. There is a time that will be the end. There is a day coming where Jesus is going to return and that's going to be it. That's the end. But he's not coming to that day. He's not coming back until every single person gets that opportunity to hear the gospel and to respond and to be saved. So in other words, there's weeds that can be in here today and you're actually going to end up being weak. And as you hear the gospel today, understand that is the heart of our God. We would say, hey, just blow it all up. Just destroy it all. God says, no, it needs more time. There, and the end is coming, but there needs more time. Because some people could be weeds, but they're going to end up being weed. Now let's look at verse 36. Jesus sent the multitude away, and then he went into the house, and his disciples came to him. And they said, they explained to us the parable of the tares of the field. Notice they don't say the parable of the wheat. That's interesting. He answered and he said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Who's the, who's the wicked one? The enemy who sowed them is the devil. This, this, is not, this is not a concept. A literal devil. There, Satan is real. The enemy, he gave the parable, he's comparing it to something else that's also real that we don't believe, we don't see. The, the one who saw them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. And therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all the things that offend 
those who practice lawlessness, that's lawbreakers, sinners, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are talking about the kingdom today. <clears throat> Not a kingdom, among others, the kingdom that belongs to you. And Father God, as we get ready to get into your word, to get into these scriptures, we pray that you would indeed allow us, by your grace and mercy, allow us to have ears to hear. Allow us to have eyes that see, hearts that are ready to receive your truth, just as it is. And Lord, if there's anything in us that would inhibit us, that would be a barrier to your truth, we pray right now that that would be cast out so that only your word would penetrate into our heart and we would understand it and be changed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in that song we sang, we talked about your, you can move the mountains. And if you know the biblical reference for that, where Jesus is saying, if you have the faith the size, does he have the faith the size of a mountain? Is that what he says? You have a faith the size of a mountain, then you can move mountains. What does he say? A faith the size of what? Mustard seed. Mustard seed is tiny. I don't have one, but I'll, I'll pretend I have one because you wouldn't see it anyway. See, this is the size of mustard seed. Have them, but they're tiny. So you may be sitting here saying, Look, I just don't have faith big enough to believe it. Then. That's not the way the kingdom works. Faith has to do with honesty, genuine heart. Little bit of real faith can move mountains. Because God is not relying on you to do anything, He did it all. When we truly believe it. It doesn't take a lot to believe. A little bit of real belief. And God can do great work. And He does great work. So, the first section we're going to look at. This is the Baptist faith and message. The doctrine of the kingdom. This is the first section. The first part of the statement of that Baptist faith and message for the kingdom. The kingdom of God includes both. His general sovereignty over the universe. And His particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge Him as King. That is the first section of the Baptist Faith and Message Doctrine of the Kingdom. Again, you can go to the Southern Baptist website, Baptist Faith and Message 2000 edition, and you can just read it right there on your phone or tablet, whatever. But this is the first part of what it says. So uh, we're going to go to Genesis 1-1 because it establishes something here. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created. It is His. God created the heavens and the earth. Everything and everyone owes its existence to God Almighty. Not only did God create it, He rules over it. So that's what it said. The kingdom includes both the idea that He's sovereign. So let's look at Psalm 89-11. Because not only did God make it, there are some religions that teach, yeah, God made it, He set things in motion, but now He's off. He's distant, He's away, there's no like personal relationship with Him. He's just this God who made stuff and then went away. But look at what it says, Psalm 89, 11, the heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all its fullness, you have founded them. Not only did He make everything, it belongs to Him as King. It is His. Everything is His. The concept that all things are created by, and all things belong to God, that is the idea that we say that's God's sovereignty. That word reign is in the middle of sovereign. Reign. He rules and reigns over everything. That's our God. He's in charge and control of everything regardless of whether the universe responds or not. Okay? So that's called general sovereignty. That's what the Baptist faith and message says. The kingdom of God includes both of these ideas. General sovereignty over the universe, but then it gets personal. 
That's personal accountability. The second half says, and his particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge him as king. So how then can a person willfully acknowledge, willfully make a decision in regard to God as king? How does that happen? Luke chapter 4, verses 42 to 43 says this, Now when it was day, he departed and he went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him. They tried to keep him from leaving them. This is Jesus. So it's on this day. He goes off to this sort of deserted place. And the crowd follows Jesus. And then it says, verse 43, But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. He says, I must preach the kingdom of God. Why? That's the purpose that he was sent here. So when we talk about, okay, how does a person willfully acknowledge? How does a person willfully come to the decision where they now see God as their king? Not just a king, but they now see Jesus as their king. It happens through the gospel. Jesus just sort of put this together. The one true God who created everything, who rules over everything, when He made the conscious decision, the willful decision to come down here and to be born of, as a man named Jesus, when He did that, He says the whole purpose that He did it was to preach the kingdom of God. So this tells us that our purpose, the meaning of our life, is to understand what it was that Jesus was preaching. If the God who created everything, the God who knows the meaning of everything, if He came down here to preach the kingdom, then that means our meaning rests in everything that He was preaching. So what did He preach when He explained His kingdom to men and women like us? This is why we're in Matthew 13. This is the kind of thing that Jesus was preaching. Verses 24 to 25. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, weeds, among the wheat, and then he went his way. So verse 24 we see here in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is using a parable to teach. And as he does in all of his parables, he takes something physical and relatable, and, and, and that's something the audience would have understood, Something physical and something relatable. And he compares it to something spiritual. Something hidden. Something unknown to them. And so he uses the comparison so that they might understand. Well, the physical relatable topic that he uses here is, is a field. He's talking about, okay, so, and we can understand this too. You know, there's fields out there and there's farmers who own those fields. We can understand that. And that's the physical relatable part. The spiritual unknown part is there's a kingdom of God in this world that you don't know about or that you might not know about just yet. That's the unknown aspect. What we find in this parable is that a man is sowing good seed in a field that he owns. So who's the man? It tells us in verse 37 of Matthew 13. He says that he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the weeds, the tares, are the sons of the wicked one. So we get to use Jesus' own interpretation. We don't have to go round and about to try to figure this out. He tells us exactly what's going on. He's like, look, there's a, there's a man who owns a field. And then he tells us later, who's that man? Oh, it's the son of man. It's Jesus Christ. In his own interpretation, we learn the world belongs to Jesus. He says, a man sowed seed in his field. The field is the world. That means it's his world. The world belongs to Jesus. Something else is also happening as it relates to this doctrine that we're looking at today. He tells us outright the parable is about the kingdom of heaven. So, if Jesus describes the world as being a field that belongs to Him, and He's comparing it to the kingdom of heaven, then it's natural to understand heaven also belongs to Jesus. Why is this important? 
Because the owner of the good seed, the owner of his own field, Jesus Christ, is owner over all of his kingdom. Jesus is the one scattering good seeds in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to Jesus, so there is no way to become part of the kingdom of heaven without going through Jesus Christ. Some of us sitting here are saying, of course, we know that. But have you considered only people who belong to Jesus are part of His kingdom. That means that only you and I who have accepted Christ for who He is, we're the only ones who can go out and tell the world the kingdom is real. So if you separate out everybody else in the kingdom and just look at you, just you, you're a good seed if you've followed Christ and been saved. If you're a good seed and God is relying on you to get that good seed to other people who are lost, where is the seed going? How far has the seed spread? Are you connecting lost people to the kingdom? See, people who are not part of the kingdom are separated from it. The Baptist faith, the message says, the kingdom of God includes both his general sovereignty and his particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge him as king. So we've seen that the kingdom is God's. The kingdom belongs to Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus rules over the entire world. There are some who acknowledge him as king and some who don't acknowledge him as king. He says there are those who willfully acknowledge him, which means there are some who don't. So Jesus says there's good seeds and there are weeds. Good seeds are His children, He teaches us, men who willfully acknowledge Him as King. The weeds are those who have the seed sown by the enemy or the adversary. He says this in verse 25. While the men slept, His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and He went His way. Verse 38 and 39 tells us that this is Satan who did this. The weeds are children of Satan. People who don't follow Christ are following Satan as though he was their father and they were his children. And they're doing what he says to do. This can be a difficult topic. This could be an uncomfortable topic. Because in one sense, okay, look, I'm lost. I, I don't put my faith in Jesus, but I mean, don't sit there and tell me I'm worshiping Satan. You know what's interesting is a lot of times we don't share the gospel because it might offend somebody. If you read what Jesus is saying here, it's pretty offensive. The truth is by nature offensive. Offensive means you are pushing something like you are, you are pushing something away. The truth pushes away the lies. The lie would say, oh, well look, I'm not saved, but I'm a good person. I'm doing the best I can. I'm not out there killing and robbing banks and things like that. Like, I'm, I'm a good person. Jesus, no, no, no. Look, there's two groups, man. There's wheat and there's weeds. Wheat, you are a follower of Christ. Weeds, you are a follower of Satan. And there is nothing in the middle. These seeds of Satan do what Satan did. Satan is charged with and guilty of putting his faith in himself. Instead of God. Children of Satan have put their faith in themselves. About how good they are. About how important they are. About what they've done for God. Whatever it is. They put their faith in themselves. And they are lost. They're children of Satan. And their lives reflect that. But we'll get into that. So we have all been born into this state of sin. We have all been born naturally, physically, as lost people. We were all born as lost people. So how do we transition from being a child of God to being a child, from being a child of the devil, sorry, to being a child of God? The only way we transition is the gospel. Repent, confess, believe. Turn from your sins. Confess Jesus as your Lord. Believe that He died on the cross and resurrected. It's a matter of our personal will to accept and believe what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. And at that moment of salvation, a person is born again. 
No longer a child of destruction and darkness, but now a child of Christ and His light. This is the teaching of the kingdom of God. Colossians 1.13 says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is that part of the Baptist faith, the message where it says, particular kingship over men. We are delivered from the power of darkness. We are released from Satan, from sin and from death. And then it says we are conveyed. If you picture a conveyor belt, right? You put something on a conveyor belt, you put it on that belt, that thing's not doing anything. It's just along for the ride. The moment you and I get saved, in other words, the moment you and I turn from our own way and say, I'm done fighting, I'm done trying to do this on my own, I'm, this is it, I'm done. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. I'm going to follow Him as my Lord. I'm going to believe He rose from the grave. Even if I don't understand it, I believe it. And at that moment that we turn to Christ, exactly as He says, look, just trust me, you're dead without me. At that exact moment, we fall on Christ and He says, okay, watch what I do. And He conveys us. He moves us from being lost and in the kingdom of Satan only to being saved in the kingdom of Christ alone. Amen. Darkness to light. Darkness to light. Concluding point number one. The kingdom is ruled by King Jesus. And He preaches forgiveness and love. He preaches forgiveness and love. When Jesus went up on the cross to die, He did it because He loves you. When He took all the sins of the world, He did it because He loves us. When He came out of the grave and extended His hand and said, I want you to be saved, He did it because He loves us. And that is what He was preaching. And that is where the kingdom begins. Repentance, confession, belief. Section number two of our doctrinal statement says this, particularly the kingdom is the realm of salvation in which men enter by trustful childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on earth. So now back to Matthew 13, looking at verse 37 and 38. He answers and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So we saw earlier, verse 37, we saw earlier the Son of Man is the owner of the field. We nailed that out. Verse 38, we, we noted the field is the world. But here we're going to examine, we're going to look at that our world has two types of people, and both of them right now are living together. There are lost people and there are saved people, and they are living together. We are all living together together on the same planet. In His field, there are wheat and there are weeds, and they are growing together today. That's what we're going to focus on in this section. This planet has two people, citizens of the kingdom and aliens from the kingdom. People who say, okay, do you know there's a kingdom of God? Here? Yeah, there's a kingdom of God. You know Jesus is king? Oh yeah, He's king. Do you see it? Absolutely. I see the kingdom of God growing and spreading everywhere I go. I see it. I see spiritual warfare. I see the kingdom just as God describes it. I see the world the way Jesus describes it. I see that. You're a citizen of the kingdom. But there are aliens from the kingdom. An alien from the kingdom, somebody that's not, somebody that's a weed, is growing up in this world in a way they were never actually meant to. They're living this life, and no matter how much good they think they're doing, there's this hole in their soul that is never filled. And they continue to try to fill it, they continue, but they're never, ever satisfied. Amen. The peace of Jesus Christ is not inside their soul. And so no matter for all they're trying, for all they're building, for all the pats on the back and applause, you're doing a great job. For all of it, they lay down at the end of the day, they look up at the stars and they say, what am I doing now? 
I feel like I don't belong here, no matter how hard I try. The Baptist faith, the message says, look, in particular, we're talking about the kingdom that's the realm of salvation. Imagine a, a, a bubble, if you will, in the middle of all of existence. And the only way you get through this veil, the only way you get through this bubble of understanding is through Jesus Christ alone. And then once you're inside it, the world becomes amplified. But then there are people who are outside the bubble. There are people who've never put their faith in Jesus. They've heard about it. They heard what Jesus did. They heard He resurrected. They've taught about it. They've said, oh, born again. It's this whole thing. It's this real thing. But they've never experienced it. And you can tell, by the way, they live their life. They're aliens from the kingdom. And Jesus says, this is exactly what it's going to look like. The wheat and the tares that he's talking about, the wheat and the weeds he's talking about, look very similar. You can't, you can't just look at them and tell the difference from a distance. Only God knows who's saved and only God knows who's lost. The lost do not experience the realm of salvation. They may know about it, they may have heard about it, but it's just a concept, it's an idea, it's a teaching. They've never been broken by their own sin. They've never fallen on Jesus to say, I'm done. And I'm trusting in you to save me because I'm done. I'm lost. Only those who've been born again by the blood of Jesus have actually entered into his kingdom and we have become good seeds. Jesus refers to those who are saved as good seeds. They've come into the kingdom of the Son of Man. You know, a seed is only able to grow using the information that it got from the fruit that it's growing in. A watermelon will only grow watermelon seeds. An apple will only grow apple seeds. A grape grows more grapes. You and I, if we put our faith in Jesus, we're called seeds. Good seeds. How does a sinner become a good seed only by the gospel of Jesus Christ and His powerful blood spilt on the cross. Amen. Resurrected three days later and then giving His Holy Spirit inside us. See, the moment you accept Christ as Savior, what happens is you become a good seed because you just planted a better seed inside you. The Holy Spirit gets implanted inside of you. And so here's the difference. A person that only has the bad seed and then they can only give more bad seeds. Even if they put Jesus' name on it, it's still bad seeds. And so they've got this bad seed in them and a bad seed can only give more bad seeds. And so no matter what they do, no matter where they go, they feel like everything is just falling apart, nothing's good. And then a person gets saved. A new seed planted inside and so now that we're telling somebody about Jesus, we're not telling an idea. We're not telling a concept. We're not telling a theory. We're saying, no, like, in me, man, I've been saved. I've been born again. Like, I'm transformed inside. The whole world's different. I, I know you don't understand, but I'm telling you, it's real. A new seed's been planted, and that's the seed that we start to give away. I'm repeating this concept over and over and over again to drive home. We are incapable of experiencing the kingdom of heaven without Jesus Christ. Amen. The seeds of Satan only grow more seeds of Satan. The seeds of Christ only grow more seeds of Christ. And both types of people are currently occupying the planet that we live on. Men and women must make a choice to place their trust in Jesus in the same way that a child places their trust in things. Simple. It's, it's not obtuse. It's not difficult, simple faith. So what is it about Jesus that's so trustworthy? Why should we ever go to Him and say, okay, I'm going to give everything up and I'm going to follow Jesus. What is it about Him that's so good? Let's look. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, says Yahweh, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord or Yahweh our righteousness. Jesus is, I'm going to list seven things here we see in this verse. Jesus is 
Number one, a fulfillment of prophecy. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. He's a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is resurrected. God says, I will raise up. He's resurrected. Jesus is a king who reigns and prospers. He doesn't fail. Jesus is a judge who is powerful and right. He's a branch of righteousness. Verse 6, Jesus is our Savior. He pulled us up out of the grave and out of hell. Jesus is a provider of safety, the Scripture says. And Jesus is Yahweh. That's the Lord God, the one true God, our righteousness. Righteousness is being right with God. Jesus is is the one to whom we get to be reconciled back to because we failed Him and we went away from Him. Jesus says, I can bring you back to where you were supposed to be. For these seven reasons, Jesus is extremely worthy to place a simple and genuine faith in. Another part of our doctrinal statement has to do with prayer. It says that Christians ought to pray that the kingdom may come and God's will be done. Why should we pray for the kingdom to be done on the earth. We may say, well, if God wants it to happen, then, then why do we have to pray for it? But once we're saved, Jesus becomes our master. And Jesus tells us, commands us to pray. This is what he says. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Master desires... He commands us to pray for this world because He wants this world to be saved. Your kingdom come, it says in verse 10. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We should pray that Christ will prosper and that Satan would falter in this world. So how does the kingdom of heaven come? We say, well, it's already here. It is. It's the now and the not yet. It's here, but it's also coming and Jesus uses this idea it's, it's continually arriving every time a person gets saved the kingdom is coming as the father answers the prayer of the church the prayer of his children we obediently serve him when we share that loving gospel and he's answering that prayer for those that are still in bondage to the evil one first Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 5 it says this come to him as to a living stone Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Peter uses this term, precious stone, living stone. But he's not just talking about gems or jewels and things like that. That does have an application in Scripture. You look at the high priest and there's some gems and jewels on his breastplate. But that's not what he's talking about. He's using this term, precious stone. Specifically in context, he's talking about the one that was rejected by men. He's talking about the idea of the cornerstone. Every building has a cornerstone. You have this stone and then everything is sort of built around it. Jesus is our cornerstone. The entire kingdom of God is built around Christ. And there are people who have rejected Jesus as the cornerstone. Even though He is the living stone, He's alive. Even though He is precious, there's none like Him, holy, separate, set apart. Even though those are all true about Jesus, there are people who reject Him. And let us not forget who Jesus was often talking to when He said, You've rejected Me. Was Jesus talking to the common person? He was talking to the religious he was talking to the religious experts, the ones that claim to know it all. He said, no, you've rejected me. And they would have said, I didn't reject God. I, I followed God. I'm doing everything He said to do. He's like, no, no you've rejected. Because you've actually put your faith in yourself and your own ability. You've never put your faith in Jesus. So 
point that Peter is making in his passage, the point that the apostles make, the point that Jesus makes, is that when we do come to Jesus, then we become, verse 5, living stones ourselves. You and I get to become our own little piece of the cornerstone of this building that God's building. You say, how is that possible? We get the gospel. The kingdom only grows when good seeds are spread. We get the gospel to be real in us, and that's the one thing that can actually build the kingdom. The whole kingdom is built on Jesus Christ and what he did. And so you and I says, we become these living stones. And then he said, look at these things. He says, you get to build up a spiritual house. That's the church. And you and I get to take the gospel, spread it out, and, and build his church. We get to serve as his holy priesthood. I hope you're in Sunday school today. If you're not, if you've not been in Sunday school, come to Sunday school. 9.45 on Sundays. I'm telling you, man, we're going through the Old Testament and it's and all it's doing is building up, helping us to understand everything Jesus did. That's what it's doing. So come to Sunday school, man. But what we've been looking at is, is everything the high priest did was a picture of what Jesus was ultimately going to do. And when he says, you're going to get to be a holy priest, you and I get to go into the Holy of Holies, do we not? Boldly entering the throne of grace sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of the blood to change lives, offering up spiritual sacrifices, our tithes, our offering, our time, our talents, our resources, our support, we get to serve in His great kingdom. It's the labor aspect of the Baptist faith and message that says we ought to pray and we ought to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on earth. Pray and labor. Living stones work in the kingdom of God. I hope that you pray. I hope we all do. We all need to be prayer warriors. But if you look at the parables that Jesus talks about, there's always people working. There's people going out to the field. There's people doing what God told them to do. Go and serve. I'm going to remind you again, we're going to have a meeting after the service today. Rotating homeless shelter. Work to be done right here. We need to pray and we need to labor. Concluding point number two, children in Jesus' kingdom are saved that we might serve our king. We are saved that we might serve our king. <laughs> final section of the Baptist Faith and Message is doctrinal statement says this, the full consummation of the kingdom awaits the return of Jesus Christ in the end of the age. This is where the kingdom wraps up. This aspect of it. Matthew 13 again, verse 39. The enemy who sowed then, the bad seed is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, the reapers are the angels. And therefore as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and then the righteous will shine forth as the Son in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The harvest is the end of the age, Jesus says. This age that we're currently living in is going to come to an end, and a new age is going to come. The Baptist faith of message says that's the full consummation of the kingdom. That word consummation is a very intentional word used in our Baptist faith of message. It's the idea of marriage, when you consummate a marriage. So people are, are engaged, and the way the Bible describes it, people are intended to be married, so they're engaged. But the marriage, and the marriage is legal, the marriage is official, but the marriage doesn't come into its full meaning until it's consummated. The, the man and the woman join together and they have a sexual relationship with each other and only each other. That's when the marriage is consummated. So this is the idea that God says, right? Jesus, we learn in the scriptures that he is our groom. We are his bride. One day our groom is coming back to get his bride. And right now the kingdom is here, but it's not consummated yet. We are engaged. We are betrothed to Jesus, but we haven't seen Him face to face. It's not fully consummated. 
He's going to come back and we're going to join with Him and we're going to be with Him forever and ever. Did you know that in marriage, that's what sexual relationship is all about? Every time the man and the woman come together, the husband and wife coming together the way that God, the Bible describes it, the way that God commands it, every time that happens, every time the husband and the wife are coming together sexually, God is saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm coming back to get you and we're going to be together forever and nothing will separate us. It's beautiful. It's beautiful the way that God intended it. It's beautiful. Amen. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His, his wife has made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb. Church, are, are we acting like a bride who's ready for our groom to come home? Are we living our life in a way prepared that we're going out and sowing the seeds of the gospel? That we're living in a way that's righteous and holy in His sight? Church, are we keeping the marriage bed clean and free of external influence? Matthew 13, 41, we see that the Son of Man is going to return in His physical appearance. This is the full consummation of the marriage to Christ. Number one is that Jesus will return in physical appearance. The Son of Man comes. Number two, Jesus will send out His angels to gather and to separate every soul that's ever lived. He's going to do that. It's going to consummate the marriage. People are going to be separated. If we're not married to Jesus, we're not part of the marriage. Number three, verse 42, Jesus is going to command the angels to throw all the lawbreakers, all the sinners who reject Jesus, throw them into the furnace of fire. That's hell. Number four, Jesus is going to command the angels to bring all the righteous. Those are sinners who have received Jesus. So they're sinners who reject Jesus, and they're sinners who receive Jesus. But guess what? We're all sinners. Jesus is going to command the angels to bring all the righteous into the kingdom of their Father. So that's part of the parable that he describes. The harvest. The field. This is actually going to happen. This is the real part. Matthew 25. This is the real part. Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you're blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in like a rotating homeless shelter. <laughs> I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Everything Jesus promises about the consummation of His marriage is going to come true. We saw it in those verses in Matthew 13 in the parable. We see them right here in Matthew 25. Number one, He's going to return in physical appearance. Verse 32, number two, He's going to send out His angels to gather and separate the souls. Number three, Jesus will command the angels to throw all the lawbreakers, all the cursed, into the furnace of fire. Goats on one side, sheep on the other side. The sheep, he says, you're going to enter in the kingdom. The goats, he said, you're going to the fire. And the difference between the two is whether or not they've accepted Jesus Christ. Are they his sheep? <clears throat> Number four, Jesus will command the angels to bring all the righteous into the kingdom of their Father. This is how the kingdom works. Are you a goat or are you a sheep? Verse 46 of that same chapter, These will go away in the everlasting punishment. That's the goats. But the righteous into eternal life. Have you placed your faith and your trust in yourself and the things of this world? You're a goat. You're lost. Have you cried out to Jesus to save you? If so, you're a sheep. 
You're saved. You're in the kingdom. So you see, the kingdom of God is described as the now and the not yet. It's here and it's coming. You may be a, a weed here today. You may be lost right now. And Jesus is knocking on your heart. It's time to confess. It's time to believe. You need to repent from your sins. Confess Jesus as Lord. Believe. God raised Him from the dead. Revelation 11, 15 says this. The seventh angel sounded a trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. Our King Jesus is coming back to consummate the marriage. To come back to be everything He said He would be. He promised through His blood He's coming back. His cross and His resurrection stand today as a guarantee that you can be forgiven of your sin. The cross says that your sin is costly. It's deadly. The resurrection says, but Jesus has power over it anyway. Do you desire to be saved today? Do you desire to be born again into the kingdom of God? Or will you sink back into the bondage of sin? Sink back into the kingdom of Satan? Rebelling against God. Fighting against Him in your heart. Which one are you going to do? I want you to know and understand Jesus has His nail-scarred hand reaching out to you today. Amen. Inviting you to be saved. Inviting you to enter into His kingdom. A kingdom you cannot get into by yourself. And here's what I want you to do as you picture Jesus reaching out to you. Because this is what the verses say. That verse in Revelation said, All who have ears, let them hear. Everyone in here has ears. Some of them work, some of them don't. <laughs> we all have ears. This is what Jesus is saying. <clears throat> there are some in here today, you've heard about this kingdom, you've realized that the kingdom is divided into two types of people, lost and saved, and God through His Word has been showing you you're lost. And He's inviting you for there to be a change. Because you've been doing it your way and it didn't work. And today He's inviting you for a change. And when you're sitting here, what I want you to picture, Jesus reaching out His hand. His hand is his nail scar in it. He's reaching out His hand. But instead right now, instead of you picturing yourself sitting comfortably in a pew and God like politely walking over and saying, Hey bud, come on. Please, pretty please, do it. Come on, please. Instead of picturing yourself in the pew, resting comfortably, if you know you've had ears today, you've been listening to the gospel, you've been listening to God's word, and God's been breathing like right into your heart, piercing in, this is you. You're not in the kingdom, and He wants you to be. If that's you. Instead of picturing yourself here in the pew, I want you to picture yourself in the grave. I don't want you to picture yourself the way you see yourself. I want you to picture yourself the way God sees you. And if you are lost, God doesn't see you sitting comfortably, living life, doing the best you can. He sees you dead and buried in the grave. And He's not reaching out politely, Saying, oh, please, pretty, pretty, please. He is punching through your coffin and saying, get up. Amen. Amen. Rise out. I died for you, I bled for you, and I rose from the grave, and you are done arguing with me. Grab my hand and let's get to it. Concluding point number three. <laughs> The reality of the kingdom will be perfected when Jesus returns. It will be perfected. And everyone will know on that day who Jesus is and who He is not. And when He sends the angels out, we're not going to juke Him out. There will be sons of light. Picture beams of light flashing from inside of you if you've got the Holy Spirit. Now picture a depth and pit of darkness in your soul if you are lost. And when the angels come, they're not going to be fooled. 
You're not going to say, if you've got the dark blackness in you and you're lost, you're not going to say, oh, this is light, I promise. I, this is light. It's good. The angels, it says, forcibly are going to grab you and yank you out and put you where you belong. And I'm saying this by the grace of God. It's where we all belong. We all belong in the fire, but Jesus came to die and resurrect so that we don't have to. We're going to have an invitation. And if God has been reaching into your soul, calling you out just as you are, I don't care how long you've been here. I don't care if this is your first time. I don't care if you've been going to church your whole life. And today God has said you're lost and I'm punching through the coffin. Let's go. If that's you, we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask as soon as I'm done praying, you get up, you march forward, and you be obedient to what God is saying to you. Enter the kingdom today. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. You are powerful and your kingdom is real. You have shown us through your scriptures today exactly how things are going to pan out when it's all over. But right now, we are in a world, we are in a field where things are growing up together. And we are either wheat or we are weeds. And you've made it abundantly clear today through your word which one we are. Father God, we're asking today for you to do the work of a living God that you've been doing for centuries and thousands of years, transforming souls by the power of your blood. We pray, God, that if those that have had ears to hear as they have heard today, that they would respond to you. We pray that all those who might need to repent would come forward and lay down at the altar and say, God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for who you are. I repent of my sin. Lord, whatever it is that you're calling us to do today in this invitation, we pray that we would be obedient. Give us power and strength to do it, God. Let us lean on you as your conveyor brings us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this invitation and you do what God tells you to do.
place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. Yeah, I want more of you, sense in the Holy Spirit, somebody heard today and willfully rejected his call. Mm -hmm. Willfully rejected it. And so if that is you, and you know that God was speaking to you as he has for many, many years, I'm not going to ask you to stand up now, that's between you and the Lord. But what I am going to tell you Devin heard the call today and he immediately came. He didn't fight. And Devin, come on up here. Did you just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Amen. Somebody here, like for the first time coming, they're getting saved. And it was supposed to be a picture for someone that's been coming for years and you're not saved and you know it. That's all I know. And if you heard what I said right before the invitation, that's exactly why I worded it the way that I did. Whether it's your first time or you've been here dozens of times, today's the day of your salvation. God's punching through the coffin. And if you willfully objected, rejected what God did, here's the evidence. That God is still ready to save you. He's still powerful to save. He's not rejecting you. He's not just wanting you forever to be in judgment and guilt. Today could be the day of your freedom. Amen. That's between you and the Lord. Devin would like to be baptized and to join Conowingo Baptist Church as a member. Can I hear a motion to receive? A motion. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All those say nay. Boo. And let's welcome our newest members. You are one of the newest members, I don't know what's going on in the world, you are one of the newest members of the kingdom of God today. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, at 
the end of the service, we're going to stand up. I invite you to stand up now. We're going to join hands. We're going to sing together. And then come up here. They're just going to shake your hand. They're going to hug you. And excuse me. This is not your church. Yes. Cindy, go ahead and read. My God's put this on Matthew 7, 21. There are people making a false profession that they think they know God and it's all up here. And it's religion or going through the, the, the steps. I really feel God wanted me to say, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. It goes on to say they're doing things in his name. Didn't I do all this? And these are people going to church. And I just, I pray to God that somebody's listening and saying, maybe I've made a profession, but I don't possess Jesus. Because he says, I never knew you, depart from me. I just am begging anybody, if they're relying on their religion or just habit of coming to Sunday, please, dear Jesus, reach into their hearts and know that he loves you. And he's going to give you so much more than just being ritual and religion. He's going to give you a relationship. Praise Amen. the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's get to it. Savior, we can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty. Stay with me. 